let's get started. Welcome everyone to this Physics of Life seminar, which will be given by Professor Michael Levin from Tufts University. Thank you everyone for attending. So before we get started, uh, just a quick reminder of the usual uh, housekeeping thing. So please mute yourself to avoid uh, feedback. But at the same time, please also open your chat box and submit questions. We might uh, ask a few to Michael during the talk, but the rest can be then saved for, for after the talk if Mike has some time to, to stick around. Sure. Yeah, and um, okay, let's cut to the chase. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Michael Levin. Um, he's a distinguished professor at, in the biology department at Tufts, sent out a Vaniva Bush chair, hopefully I pronounce it correctly, and uh, as the director of the Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology, as well as the Allen Discovery Center. Uh, he won a number of prizes, such as the Scientist of Vision Award and the Distinguished uh, Scholars Award. And then his career started quite unusually, I think, uh, with dual bachelor degrees in computer science and biology. And uh, uh, from there on, he uh, went on to get a PhD at Harvard University on embryonic development and left-right asymmetric, asymmetric body structure. And now fast forwarding uh, to today through a highly successful career, uh, his lab is interested in the bioelectric language of cells, the swarm intelligence, and the rational control of growth and form, in particular, then this applications in regeneration and also artificial intelligence. So he can correct me if I'm, I'm wrong. Uh, hopefully I produce this correctly. So without further ado, I hand over to, to Mike, and I'm really looking forward to his talk. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Uh, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here and to have the opportunity to talk to you all. And uh, if anyone wants to get in touch with me afterwards here uh, at these websites are all the primary papers, the, uh, the numbers, the data, the software, everything is here. And uh, please uh, feel free to uh, contact me afterwards. So um, these are the main points that I would like to transmit today. Um, one thing that we will talk about is the fact that there are significant knowledge gaps about the control of large scale anatomical homeostasis. And as engineers, we view this as a design challenge. So we want to understand it, but we also want to implement it from scratch. And uh, I think that really fundamental advances in biomedicine is going to require not only understanding the molecular mechanisms, but actually the decision making that occurs in cellular collectives or tissues. And I'm going to tell you that one key medium for computation uh, in this area is non-neural bioelectricity. So we've developed some techniques to listen in and manipulate the electrical conversations that bind individual cells into very robust, uh, large-scale agents that uh, are able to process information and make anatomical decisions. It's a kind of physiological software. And what we're working on is this notion of cracking the bioelectric code which is the mapping between electrical patterns in the body and uh, genetic and uh, anatomical outcomes. And we think that this will enable a kind of uh, electroceutical approach for all sorts of applications and birth defects, uh, regenerative medicine, cancer, as well as uh, synthetic bioengineering. So if I had to uh, boil the whole talk down to about two sentences, I would tell you the following, that like the brain, uh, your body tissues form electrical networks that make decisions. These are decisions about dynamic anatomy. And now we have ways to target the system to control large scale pattern editing and to override some genomic defaults. And so this, we think this has real advantages. And so I show you um, right up front, uh, I'm going to say that you in this talk, we'll see all kinds of uh, really weird looking creatures and, and, and animals. And so like here's our five legged frog. And these are not Photoshop. These are real uh, live animals that exist in our lab. And these are models for us in which we test our various theories okay, of, of anatomical structure. So <clears throat> in our center, we ask a number of fundamental questions about the relationship uh, of the, the genome to the anatomy. Uh, the question of, of, of scaling of purposive activity, that is how are competent cells uh, working together towards a very large anatomical um, goals. And we ask in practical terms, how can we target this process for, get, for getting better control of the outcome for regenerative medicine, synthetic biology, and so on. And moreover, uh, about 30% of my lab is computational. So we uh, ask in both directions, what can developmental biology 
learn from advances in computer science and machine learning? And in, in contrast, what can artificial intelligence and uh, A-Life learn from the things that we're discovering in developmental biology? So let's first um, talk about some of these knowledge gaps. And, and uh, I'd like to introduce this, this really important concept of anatomical homeostasis. So if we think forward to what is the end game of our activity, what's the goal of everything we're trying to do? Uh, one of the most uh, important uh, central pieces is control of large scale anatomical structure. Because if we were able to convince cells to build exactly what we wanted them to build, we would basically solve almost all problems of biomedicine. So birth defects, traumatic injury, cancer, aging, all of this would be addressed if we knew how to get cells to build what we wanted them to build. And so I look forward to a day where we have something that I call an anatomical compiler. The idea being is that you should be able to sit down and draw the way that we now do with, with various machinery parts and so on, uh, as if it were a CAD system. We draw the kind of animal or plant that you want, so you specify it at the anatomical level. And then if we understood how this process worked, the, uh, the, the, the compiler would be able to give us a set of stimuli that would have to be given signals and stimuli that would have to be given to the individual cells to build whatever it is that we want to build. And we've only, clearly we are nowhere near this capability in the general case, but we've had some uh, specific um, specific uh, successes, such as I'll tell you today about these planarium. Okay, so this is this is the, the goal towards which we're working, basically complete control of, of growth and form. And so this is an important question because there are a number of uh, outstanding big picture items that are still um, real, largely unknown. So for example, we, we all start life as, uh, as, as, as a group of um, these uh, embryonic blastomeres, descendants of an egg, and then this is a cross section of a human torso. And you can see this incredible complexity, this uh, just uh, a, a remarkable invariant uh, arrangement of all the tissues and organs that are in the right uh, shape, uh, proportion, relationship to each other, and so on. And we know that what the genome actually specifies are proteins. And so the question is, well, where does this anatomical structure come from? How do cell groups know what to make and when to stop remodeling? As engineers, we'd like to know how, how much plasticity is there? Could we get the cells to build something completely different? And in regenerative medicine, we would like to know if part of this is missing or damaged, how do we repair it? So let's look at our building blocks. Um, unlike in a lot of engineering, uh, our building blocks are not passive, they're highly competent. So this is a single cell, and this is known as a lacrimaria. Uh, it, as you can see here, it is, it, it's, it's hunting for, for food in its environment. This uh, creature is incredibly competent on its own single cell, cell scale. So it solves all of its physiological, its behavioral, its anatomical needs all in one cell. There's no brain, there's no nervous system, there are no stem cells, there's no cell to cell communication. Everything is solved in one cell. And so these are the sorts of uh, building blocks that um, uh, bodies are made of. And, and the, the, the fascinating thing is that uh, the intelligence of these cells did not disappear when they became multicellular structures. In fact, they scaled their computational capabilities to work towards much bigger goals. So instead of single cell goals, we have individual um, uh, uh, cells that make uh, uh, tissues and organs. And so this is embryonic development. You see here, reliably, this one cell can give rise to uh, various progeny that work together to build these remarkably complex, uh, uh, beautiful um, anatomies. And we know that actually simply differentiating cell type is not sufficient because this thing down here, this is a teratoma and it's a tumor that might have skin and hair and bone and teeth and muscle. So the uh, stem cell biology here has, has proceeded correctly. In other words, you're getting all of your um, terminally differentiated tissues but what's missing is the three-dimensional organization, and that's what's really uh, what we really want to understand. So, um, in standard developmental biology, the paradigm looks something like this: there are gene regulatory networks, so these genes interact with each other. Some of these genes make effector proteins, which are either sticky or they they exert force, so they diffuse. They have various physical properties. And then there's this um, process of emergence whereby lots of these complex local interactions happen in parallel and out comes something like this. This is a salamander uh, that you'll see again, the axolotl. And so 
so so this is this is all uh, the, the all of these steps are, are are correct, but but there's a fundamental difficulty here, which is that there's a there's a profound inverse problem that if you wanted to make changes out here and you wanted to make this anatomy to be different, what would you have to change early on? And and trying to reverse this story is is really um, very difficult. And I'll show you a very simple example of where we come across this. So here are some flatworms. I'm going to talk a lot about flatworms today. So these are planaria. And here are two species, one with a flathead, one with a roundhead. And we know that the cells of this flathead species, when you cut off any part of the body, for example, cut off the head, they are able to regenerate the uh, the exact correct shape and then they stop. So these, so these green cells make a flathead. This is a different species. These red cells know how to make a roundhead and they do this 100% of the time. Um, so one, one could ask if we take some of these green cells and we transplant them into this body and we and we let them mix around and this works perfectly well, you can transplant cells at will here, uh, then we amputate the head, what head shape are we going to get? So is, is one shape dominant? Is it going to be a mix of the two shapes? Or is there never going to be an end to the regeneration because neither uh, type of cell is ever happy about what kind of head is currently being built, so they're going to keep going. So the important thing is that um, despite all of the really great papers in science and nature on the molecular uh, pathways that determine differentiation of these cells, and there are many such papers, we as a field still do not have not even a single model of that makes a prediction in the simple experiment. Okay, so, so we don't have any models that make a prediction on this at all. And so while we're getting really good at the mechanisms that are necessary for this to happen, we're really not very good yet at the algorithms that determine uh, what the cells are building and what is their actual stop condition. So um, what we are interested in doing in my group is to, trying to move uh, biology uh, beyond the focus on the hardware or at best the machine code, which is you know sort of the, the, the low level uh, molecular signaling, which is of course very, very critical to understand. But we'd like to ask some, some higher level questions of the kind that people understand and, 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 and work on in neuroscience. So what might some anatomical native modules be that exist in, in the organism that we're trying to reverse engineer? What are their triggers? What do cellular collectives measure? Um, how do they detect anatomical error? And really uh, sort of central to all this is how reprogrammable is biological hardware, you know? And so um, one of the things that I get a lot of inspiration from is the journey of, uh, that computer science took. So, so what you see here, this is what uh, computer programming looked like in the 40s and 50s. So in order to program this, she literally has to rewire it physically. She has to physically alter the machine in order to get it to do something different. And of course, the reason we have this amazing uh, information technology revolution now is because computer scientists figured out early on that if the hardware is good enough, and I'm going to argue that biological hardware is, is definitely good enough, then what you can focus on is control of the system via inputs, experiences, or stimuli, not necessarily via rewiring. So you can offload a lot of the computational complexity onto the system if you ask what 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 are some of the properties of the uh, of the software control, not of just of the hardware that already exist in the system, and how could we take advantage of this? And this allows for much more powerful control as anyone who's tried to program in, for example, machine language versus a, a modern high level language knows. And the point isn't to try and make a strong analogy between modern between traditional computer architectures and biology. There are certainly many places where that breaks down. That's not the point. The point is that there's a very uh, interesting um, aspect of this that uh, asks what what is possible with the exact same hardware, right? Without having to rewire the system at the genetic or molecular level. So. Let me introduce uh, some some examples of plasticity. So here, for example, is a, is an axolotl. This animal uh, regenerates its limbs, its eyes, its jaws, uh, portions of the brain, the heart, um, ovary, spinal cord during its lifetime. And if you amputate the limb, what it will do is, uh, is, is, is the cells will grow very rapidly. Um, and then when they have completed growing a correct salamander arm, then they stop. And so this is one of the most profound aspects of this, which is that uh, this is a, uh, how, how do they know when to stop? You know, this is a self-limiting, but very rapid growth process. And in addition to that, we have this animal. So these are the planaria I told you about. Um, these guys have a true centralized brain, some complex internal organs and so on. They can be cut into many pieces. The record is something like 257 pieces or something like that. And every piece will grow exactly what's needed, no more, no less, 
and then it stops when it's done. So it makes a tiny little worm. So in fact, they're so highly regenerative, they're actually immortal. There's no such thing as an old worm. They continuously regenerate whatever is missing and so on. So, uh, so, so this is an amazing model system to understand this kind of uh, plasticity. Now, I should point out that regeneration is not just for so-called lower animals. You know, the human liver, of course, is highly regenerative. Um, that's been known for a long time. I actually have no idea how the ancient Greeks knew that, but, uh, but they did. Um, deer are a large adult mammal that regenerates uh, bone vasculature innervation uh, every year at the rate of a centimeter and a half per day, you know, incredible um, rates of growth. And then human children have been known to regenerate their fingertips um, after a clean amputation, and then usually we lose this ability. Okay, so one one example that um, that I want to show you is, that that illustrates this uh, this the 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 control uh, aspects of this plasticity process is this. So uh, this is something we discovered um, in our group a few years ago. Um, you, tadpoles, in order to make a frog, need to rearrange their face. So the eyes have to move, the jaws have to move, um, the nostrils, everything sort of has to move around to, to transform a typical um, tadpole face into a frog face. So what was thought at the time was that uh, basically every, um, uh, every organ primordium has it is simply a fixed way of movement because every tadpole looks the same and every frog looks the same. So if the starting conditions are the same, you just move everything in the right direction, the right amount, and then you get your frog. So what we did was create what we call these Picasso tadpoles right here. And I'm going to tell you in a couple minutes how we make them. And what we discovered was that actually these Picasso tadpoles largely make perfectly normal frogs. So as uh, what happens is all of these different, um, the eye and the jaws and everything else, they move through uh, uh, abnormal, unconventional uh, paths to end up where they're going, to end up in a correct frog face. And when they end up in a cor correct frog face, that's when they stop moving. So what the genetics actually gives us is a, is, a, is a system that executes a really flexible program of error minimization. It doesn't get, is not troubled by the fact that things start off in the wrong configuration. It will simply continue to move in a way that minimizes distance from a particular anatomical layout, and then it will stop when it's done. So now this raises a couple of obvious questions, and we formalized it like this. So, so here's the feed forward aspect of, of emergence of form, but there are really important feedback loops um, at the level of genetics and of course at the level of physics, which is what I'm going to talk about today, that uh, activate when the animal is deviated from its correct target morphology. And this could be injury, it could be birth defects, it could be teratogens, it could be a parasites, it could be mutation, lots of different things. And so um, the part here, and so and so this this we call this pattern homeostasis because it's very you know most of you will recognize this is a very simple uh, uh, homeostatic loop. Um, the 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 existence of feedback loops, of course, is is nothing new. Biologists all well understand that there are lots of uh, lots of feedback loops everywhere. But there are two parts here that are that are novel. One part is that the set point of this homeostatic process. You know, this this the, the process itself is 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 read the current state compared to the set point, and then activate some steps that hopefully get you closer to the set point, and then repeat until that delta is is significantly uh, smaller. Um, so so two special pieces to this. One is that the set point here is not a simple scalar like pH or metabolic level, you know, hunger or the level of some hormone. It's actually a fairly complex information structure that to some level of detail, obviously not to its individual cell positions, but to some level of detail specifies a correct anatomical layout. So in the case of that frog face correcting itself, it's the rough layout of what a normal frog face is supposed to look like. So the set point is complex. And it's the, it's, it's the whole idea that this system is not uh, purely emergent from, from local interactions, but there's actually a, uh, uh, an explicit representation of a future goal state. Now, that, is, that kind of talk is conspicuously absent from most developmental biology book textbooks nowadays, although that didn't used to be the case, because um, you know, it's, it, it was thought that, that we should kind of stay away from, from anything that, uh, that sounds like, uh, like, like a representation of a future goal, although uh, here we're using it in a very um, non, sort of non-threatening, non-mysterious way, but in the sense of cybernetics and control theory, that there are a set of states that are somehow represented by cells that guide uh, the, the, the way that the system uses energy to rearrange itself. So, so this is this is a, an unusual um, hypothesis in this field. If it's true, it makes a very strong prediction. The prediction is that if there is in fact 
some kind of represented uh, set point, we ought to be able to uh, edit that information without changing the machine. In other words, leave the cells exactly as they are, so wild type cells, but alter the information that, can, that uh, uh, establishes that set point and thus make the cells build something else. So get around the inverse problem in this way by, by, by addressing the, the, the information structure that's, that implements the top-down control. So, so that's the strong prediction, and so that's what we've been doing, trying to find the mechanisms for this homeostatic set point and see if we can rewrite it and let the cells build to the new specification. And I'm gonna show you some examples of this. Okay, so, so um, me mechanistically, we started looking at something called bioelectricity, and uh, basically most of the things that you, you know from neuroscience hold true in, in every other cell type in the body, uh, with the exception that uh, the time is a lot slower. So most things in, in neuroscience, if you simply change the, um, uh, the time scale from milliseconds to, uh, to, to, to minutes and hours, a lot of things still hold true. So, of course, uh, I should point out, this is, this is uh, cr critical to say, is that I'm going to spend the next um, half hour talking about bioelectricity as, as a key component of this morphogenetic field. This is simply a field of information that impinges on cells in, in three dimensions uh, within the body. And, of course, I'm not uh, making the claim that bioelectricity does everything. So, clearly, there are chemical gradients, extracellular matrix, tensions, pressures, oxygen gradients, all these sorts of things that are all important. Uh, bioelectricity just happens to be the one that, um, that that we work on, and I think it's particularly interesting. And it would be, I think, uh, a shame to uh, to think of bioelectricity as simply one more mechanism that has to be added to uh, all of the complexity that biology uses. I think it's actually more than that. I think it's a computational layer that gives privileged access to some really interesting top-down controls. And uh, I think it's not an accident that that um, the evolution of brains uh, from the system actually uh, exploited some of these features of, of, of electrical networks. But but these same these same features may at some point be discovered actually in these other modalities as well. Um, okay, so so in the brain we have the following story that uh, the hardware of the brain looks like this. There are um, there are neurons. These are cells that use ion channels on their surface to set up uh, bioelectric states. These states can propagate under specific conditions to neighbors uh, through gap junctions. So these little little electrical synapses are known as gap junctions. And, uh, and this, this, this uh, combination of, of steady and propagating states is the electrical activity of the brain. And so the commitment of neuroscience is to, the, to, to this idea that that electrical activity actually encodes the information uh, con content of the brain. So you have here, for example, this is a, a, a video uh, of a zebrafish uh, brain as the zebrafish is uh, processing various inputs. And you can see here all the flashing. This is, this is all the electrical activity. And there's this concept of neural decoding. The idea is that we read the electrical activity, and if we understood how to decode it, we would be able to infer the uh, semantic content of that information. What is the animal seeing? What uh, what memories does it have? What uh, plans does it have? You know, the, the 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 cognitive structure of this animal. We ought to be able to infer from the electrical activity. That's what neuroscience is trying to do. And actually, there have been some some successes in this area. So it turns out that actually all cells in the body do this. So all cells in the body have ion channels. Most cells are connected electrically to their neighbors. And these are very interesting gates that uh, gap junctions can open and close under various conditions. So these are literally synapses. Um, and you can, you can port many of the, the strategies and the concepts from neuroscience to many other cell types. So for example, we are interested in reading out here. Here's a, an early frog embryo. Uh, you're seeing that the colors are uh, a voltage sensitive fluorescent dye that is reporting all the electrical states as this time lapse proceeds. And this embryo uh, figures out where should be the left, the right, uh, the dorsal, ventral, and, and, and so on. And if we, if we understood how to decode this thing, we would be able to make predictions about gene expression, about anatomy, uh, about various uh, future states of the system based on understanding the information processing. So uh, we developed uh, some tools to do this. Uh, of course, these voltage sensitive fluorescent dyes that uh, allow us to uh, uh, sim simply get, get maps in vivo of what all the electrical states are. And then we do a lot of simulation. So if we know what the ion channels and pumps are and, and the different gap junctions that are present in various cells, 
we could put together a quantitative simulation of why the voltage is what it is and how it relates to these uh, to these different uh, different channels. So let's let's take a look at what some of these patterns look like. So here's an early frog embryo uh, putting its face together, and again this is time lapse. This is a voltage dye. It's in grayscale. You can see hyperpolarized and depolarized cells. And the reason I'm showing you this example, which we call the electric face, and this was first discovered by my colleague Danny Adams, um, is that the decoding here in this particular case, and there are other cases that are much tougher in this particular case, the decoding is really simple. So when you look at this electrical pattern, you can almost see the face. So here's where the eye is going to come out. Uh, the, right, the, the animal's right eye comes out first. Um, here is where the mouth is going to be. You've got some placards out here. Uh, this, is, this is literally a pre-pattern. This is a bioelectric pre-pattern that drives the necessary gene expression localizations and thus the anatomy of the early frog face. This is how we made those Picasso tadpoles because this pattern is instructive. If you interfere with it, and change the electrical properties of these cells and these cells and put them some and put these voltage states somewhere else not moving the cells but moving just the voltage states the uh the face is is going to be uh, is going to be entirely different and so the gene expression and, and the cell movements and everything else is going to change so this is one example and we I, th I think we got very lucky with this because some other ones require a lot more decoding to really uh, understand um, what's going on this one is pretty straightforward as far as being able to read out from the electrical activity of the cellular network, what shape it's trying to build. So that is a natural endogenous necessary pattern in development. Here's a pathological pattern. So what we can do is introduce human oncogenes into these tadpoles, they make tumors, but even before the tumor becomes uh, anatomically um, uh, or, or morphologically uh, apparent, you can already see the aberrant bioelectric. You can you see, can that, see these that these cells, cells are, are um, uh, highly uh, highly polarized, and uh, and they are about to uh, uh, disengage. The gap junctions are going to close. They're going to disengage from the rest of the uh, electrical uh, network and uh, basically treat the rest of the body as external environment. They revert back to a unicellular metastatic lifestyle. So these are, and then there's some obvious uh, applications here for diagnostics and so on. Hey, so, um, Mike, just one one second. Mustafa sure. had a question. Can I just ask this briefly? Of course. It was about your previous uh, part on the planaria. Yep. Uh, the question was if they naturally die, and if they die, um, so um, why do they die if they can completely regenerate? Yeah, the planaria don't die. I mean, you can kill them, and various things eat them, and they can be poisoned, and they, you know, they, they're not they're not invincible, of course. So there are many things that will kill a planarian, but they do not die of old age. There's no such thing as uh, that anybody has ever seen of a of an aging a planarian that has died of old age. It doesn't it doesn't happen. Fascinating, and it's already on the next slide here again. Yeah, very good. Great. Um, okay. And so, and so, besides the uh, the ability to to observe these patterns, of course, really critical is to develop uh, uh, techniques for functional uh, intervention. So to change the patterns and thus do do functional experiments to show that they actually do something. So we developed a couple of tools, basically very similar to synaptic plasticity and intrinsic plasticity in neuroscience. Basically. Here are, the, here are the two things we can do. If we have a non-neural uh, set of uh, cells, we can control the topology so we can open or close gap junctions so that we determine which cells talk to which other cells. Or we can directly uh, set the electrical state of the various cells by opening and closing channels. These might be native channels. These might be channels that we put in. These might be optogenetic channels that we can gate via light. In all of this, I should say there are no electrodes, there are no external electric field applications. Everything I'm going to show you today is molecular physiology. So we, we don't apply any kind of external stimulation to these things. We are turning on and off endogenous components of electrical signaling in cells. And there's pharmacology and genetics ways to, that we do that. So let me show you some examples. So these are, these are early uh, uh, examples that we found to show that these bioelectrical signals uh, are actually important in determining growth and form because that was certainly not uh, not not expected and not obvious. So so one thing you can do is we can introduce in the early frog embryo an mRNA encoding one of uh, several different channel types, and it will set the 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 voltage of the progeny of these cells to a specific range and basically establish an I 
uh, a voltage I spot like what I showed you in the electric phase. When you do this, the region that in which you, ex you, uh, you, you set this up develops into an I. So these, so, so here's an I um, being developed out of gut cells. There are two sort of notable pieces to this outside the fact that it's bioelectric. One is that it is being done way outside the anterior neural field. So master regulators like PAC6 and these kind of genes only induce only induce eyes up here. And so it's, it was thought that actually the anterior neurectoderm is the only tissue capable of making an eye. So that's not true. Lots of uh, actually um, cells can, uh, locations can make eyes. The other interesting thing is that it's extremely modular. So these eyes can contain the right internal structure, all the same uh, cell types that they're supposed to have. So, so lens, retina, all, all of that stuff. And, but the signal that we gave is actually very simple. In other words, the trigger is quite simple. We certainly didn't give it enough information to specify how to make an eye. So we think of this as a modular subroutine call, as a trigger of a native module that can kickstart uh, appropriate self-limiting morphogenetic cascades. And so in this way, you can make eyes, we can make limbs, we can make brains and kind of hearts, uh, lots of organs that we don't yet know how to make. And this is part of, uh, part of uh, cracking this bioelectric code. So here is the planarian story about which uh, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit now. Uh, when we amputate the head and the tail, how does this piece know which end is anterior and which end is posterior? So it develops this, this uh, really interesting bioelectric gradient where depolarization tends to be at the anterior end, hyperpolarization tends to be at the posterior end. And if we artificially uh, duplicate this, let's say turn this part down here uh, depolarized, then you can do this with, with, with pharmacology, targeting ion channels, or with RNAi, um, knocking down some, some pumps. Um, then in fact, you can generate a two-headed worm. And so, so these cells back here can be induced to make a proper head Again, much like here, very um, in a modular fashion, you, we, we give it a signal that basically says head goes here, and that's what they build. You can make worms that have no head, and then there's, of course, interesting behavioral um, questions that, that we're asking about this. So in this example, what I'm showing you is that when you manipulate the standing bioelectric patterns, you make... Uh, coherent large-scale changes to the anatomy. So these are not, um, th this is not a housekeeping parameter because by tweaking it, you can control uh, anatomical outcomes. This is, um, and this is not something that causes uh, toxicity or death. It actually is, 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 a, is, a, is an information carrier f that's instructive for outcomes. And so what, in, in this particular case, what we've, what we've told these cells here is that they need to make a head and they make a normal planarian head that's correctly scaled, um, correctly shaped and so on. But we can go further than this. And we found that actually, if you take, uh, if you take a planarian and, and uh, this one has a nice uh, characteristic triangular head shape here, you amputate that head, you take the middle piece and you, uh, expose that middle piece to a reagent that blocks these electrical synapses. It basically uh, reduces the ability of cells to talk to each other um, uh, electrically. And when you do this, so you do this for about 48 hours, then you pull out the drug, you let the, the electrical network settle back into connectivity. Um, and what it will do is it'll settle back down. And sometimes it settles back down in a state that makes the correct planarian head. And so, so it just makes the normal head shape. But other times it settles into a different attractor that belongs to an entirely different species. So you can get round heads like this S Mediterranean. You can get flat heads like the, here, like this, like this P Felina. And we can do we've we've done all sorts of morphometrics to compare these things. But not only does the head shape change, but in fact the shape of the brain and the distribution of stem cells becomes exactly like these other species. So without any genetic change, remember that the, the genome of these animals is untouched. We haven't done <clears throat> any um, DNA editing or anything like that. Um, you can access regions of the morphospace that belong to other species. Uh, about 150 million years, I would estimate, uh, distance between this and these. And uh, this is a stochastic process. And the frequency of getting these other head shapes is proportional to the uh, predicted genetic difference between the actual species that use that 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 have these heads. So there's a very interesting um, evolutionary um, story um, to be told here. And in Mike, fact, can I just yeah. ask something briefly, Mike? Sure. Um, so if I understand correctly, you manipulate essentially the membrane potential, right? So so, so for this particular so for this particular experiment, what we do is we reduce the electrical coupling between the cells. So we basically disconnect 
all of the cells partially from each other, and then we let them connect back up, and we and 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 the system tries to get back to the correct bioelectrical state, but sometimes it fails and it lands in a different uh, different stable attractor. But I think on one of your earlier slides, maybe two back, you had uh, I think the symbol for membrane potential. So at least it was one of the parameters you apparently were able to influence. Yeah, but of course it's a very a generic parameter. So, um, but if you say, um, uh, so how, how does the cells then know how to read this out? Uh, ultimately, you know, to make an eye or yeah. another limb, I mean, there's something very specific going on downstream, right? Um, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm, I, and I'm getting to that. We're going we're gonna to talk about interpretation of the bioelectric code. I mean, in the end, uh, what, what, what actually happens, I mean, I'll just, I'll just uh, tell you, tell you this, the system now. So, so what happens is very much like in the brain, what happens is there's an electrical network that makes decisions at the level of the electrical network. In other words, it's a circuit that takes inputs and it generates various outputs across the tissue. So there's a bioelectric pattern that results across the tissue. So think about a standard neural network type of architecture where inputs come in, there's some computations, and then there's a bioelectric state that comes out. That bioelectric state is transduced, and I'm gonna show you a few of those molecular mechanisms. This, th that part is already known, it's transduced into changes in gene expression and into changes of cell behavior, motility, cell division, differentiation, all of those things. So, um, of course, downstream of the bioelectrical decision making is all the typical mechanisms that we know are required for this process. So to make an eye, you need to turn on a bunch of genes, including PAC6 and RIX1 and all these different things to make a, uh, a, an eye or a head or whatever. The, tr the, the transcriptional stuff is downstream. Uh, and we know how the coupling works, but the real trick, which we only understand in a couple of cases so far, is to decode, very much like in the nervous system, is to decode the computational part. So what, what are, what are the, uh, the, 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 the processing, the representation, um, and, uh, and the computations that are happening in that electrical layer before it feeds down to turn on all of the gene expression um, domains? And so, can I, can I, sorry, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So, when, when I guess when 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 I think of a pattern formation in the biological setting, is all uh, typically is about protein gradients or morphogen gradients, right? So, are you saying that the bioelectric uh, pathway is the master switch that control everything else? Because obviously. Uh, we, we know if you mess up the, the protein gradient of, uh, in some developmental program, then you won't develop, uh, the organism won't develop into the proper. Of course, of course, thing. yeah, sure, sure. So, okay, so so three three things to keep in, in mind here. Um, first of all, the whole notion of a master regulator uh, has to be a little bit modified because all of these things are, are cycles. In other words, uh, you, you can't really ask the question of what is on top because there is no top because every, every process, no matter what process you pick, there's a process before it that gave rise to that process. So there's a kind of inter, there's a kind of constant interplay between the, uh, the bioelectrics, the, the biomechanics and, and the biochemistry. However, what you can ask are uh, questions about which node has the most power to control downstream complex events with the least input. So so so-called master regulators, what's nice about them is that they they give you they give you this this maximal power of a of a simple intervention that makes a very large difference downstream. So you can practically pick out some some uh, some nodes in this very complex network that as I said before has you know biochemical gradients of course it has biomechanics and so on. You can pick out these nodes. And so if we ask so so now we can ask a couple of questions. First of all, um, are, are uh, biochemical gradients altered when you change the function of the bioelectrical network? And the answer is absolutely. So we've seen the distribution of morphogens uh, change. We've seen gene expression change, cell behavior change. All of this stuff can be controlled by the bioelectrical network. Now, I am not saying that in every single case under the sun, the bioelectrical network is the most efficient control node. Uh, that's, I'm sure that's not the case. I'm sure there are some situations where the biochemistry drives and there are some situations where the biomechanics drives. I'm, of course, showing you some, some examples where the bioelectrics drives because that's what we're interested in. But I will also point out that in the examples where we have seen, where we have put things head to head, uh, where there is a, um, there's a classic, um, a classic master regulator of some process that's a biochemical or a genetic state or, or a chemical gradient, 
and uh, and and a bioelectric one. In in every case that I've seen so far, it it has turned out that uh, the bioelectrics are the better way to control the system. But I'm absolutely not claiming that that's a universal truth. Uh, I'm quite sure that there will be ev evolution uh, uses whatever is most convenient, and I'm sure there will be cases where uh, the biochemistry is is a better driver. But but for these systems, the st the things you're talking about are in fact downstream. So when we um, when we alter these electrical uh, electrical states, we see everything else change. All of the typical markers that people use to, to see these gradients and everything else, every, everything changes. Thank you. Great. So, um, so, so I've shown you how you make uh, how to make ectopic uh, heads and, uh, and 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 change to the heads of other species. We can also access regions of the morphous space that are actually not ex uh, explored by evolution. So you make a planaria where the body plane is completely different. So it's got this weird spiky shape. We can make ones that are instead of flat and bilaterally symmetrical are now radially symmetrical. And we can make combinations of flatworms don't even have to be flat. And so there's really quite a bit of power to alter what genetically wild type cells are going to build. And uh, the um, and we're using it, and the goal, of course, is to is to is to push this towards a very um, predictive uh, type of application. Because here, for example, we have regenerative medicine um, applications in our in our group. So here, this is a frog. Unlike a salamander, frogs do not regenerate their legs. So you cut off the leg, nothing happens. We've come up with a, a bioelectric cocktail that stimulates the wound to a build the leg here kind of signal, the same way I showed you an eye and uh, signal. And so when you do this. Um, when you do this, uh, you get uh, uh, you get re the, the kickstart regeneration. You got some toes. You've got a toenail. Uh, the treatment. So this is this is interesting because the treatment here is only one day, and a one day treatment kickstarts 13 months of leg growth, during which time you never touch the system again. So it really is a very early trigger to intervene in the in the decision making of those cells, which occurs apparently in, in this case and at the electrical level. And then downstream of that, all of the things you need to actually build the leg get turned on. So all the different gradients and everything else get turned on without any intervention on, on, on our part. And so I've shown you data on frog and worm and, and people sort of wonder whether this has anything to do with mammals. I mean, the reality is that uh, evolution discovered this stuff back around the time of uh, bacterial biofilms. Um, so there's some, there's some great work uh, now looking at uh, electrical signaling in bacterial colonies. And we've done a lot of this in human uh, mesenchymal stem cells, although in vitro, it's not quite as exciting as in vivo, uh, what, what the phenotypes are. But um, here I have to do a disclosure, which is that uh, we have a spinoff company called Morphoceuticals Inc., where we're actually uh, trying to take what we've done in frog, which is to solve the leg regeneration uh, problem in frog and turning a non-regenerative animal into a regenerative animal without any gene therapy or anything like that, and uh, trying to apply it to mammals. So we have uh, we are now um, starting experiments in in rodents to uh, drive what hopefully someday will be limb uh, limb regeneration applications. So uh, we. You know, in in thinking about how the bioelectrics actually couples to downstream, you know, how do voltages talk to the genome? On a single cell level, we already know this. So we know there are at least half a dozen mechanisms by which bioelectric change controls gene expression. So of course, there's calcium signaling, which is familiar from neuroscience, but there are also some other interesting uh, interesting transduction methods. So this is this is known, and which genes are downstream is also known. We have all kinds of candidate genes, but also unbiased approaches like uh, gene um, uh, NGS, you know, and, and RNA-seq and so on that tell us what, what the targets are. So, so, so these, these data on the single cell level are known, but they're sort of profoundly unsatisfying in an important way, because as I started out in the talk by saying that uh, our goal is not to understand why a particular cell becomes a particular cell type. Our goal is to understand the determination of large-scale anatomy. And so what we spend most of our time doing is making these uh, uh, sort of multi-scale models whereby within a single cell, you simulate the various uh, transcriptional and bioelectric circuits that exist. And then you model this, uh, this, this circuit in every cell of a large collective, like a, like a virtual planarian. And then you can ask tissue level questions, like when we cut it into pieces, does this circuit rescale itself? So does this kind of gradient reappear? And these are very parallel questions to things that you might ask of reaction diffusion systems for like Turing patterns and, and chemical morphogens and so on. But actually, uh, and I don't have time to go into all the details, but actually the bioelectric um, 
circuits have some some really um, nice properties with respect to stability and so on uh, compared to the the biochemical models. And so we try to build from the from the gene regulatory networks to an understanding of the ion channel activity in single cells to tissue-wide dynamics and ultimately to the algorithms that we can use to control, to infer what changes need to be made in order to uh, get particular outcomes. And the the cool part about this, is, and so and so we've developed, and again, this is largely the work of Alexis Pytak, our collaborator. Uh, there's some software that you can download that are simulators for all this kind of thing. So you can now um, actually get this and play with it. What's neat is that by making these simulations, you can do virtual experiments and ask if they agree with uh, with with results and they predict new experiments and ask uh, you know how uh, how various uh, scenarios would play out but they are also uh, quite amenable to machine learning approaches and so we've used both uh, uh, genetic algorithms and and other ways to identify this kind of needle in a haystack sort of uh, uh, experimental um, trigger or intervention that would work in a complicated system like this to get the particular outcome because because we are now starting to gain a rational understanding of these circuits so that we can we can search a, a more tractable space of possible intervention so that's how that's how we're hoping to get to, to, to medicine and so the example I want to show you just uh, uh, just Mike one quick question if sure. you don't mind of course so Mark had a question on the chat box um, he was wondering um, whether, um, say if it's really electric or if it's really about um, chemistry. For instance, if you have, um, let's say, if you would replace some manganese ions yeah. by calcium ions, would yeah. you get similar results, or is Great it really chemistry specific? Great question. Yeah, yeah, we we did all this, and and we and we 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 do this in every every bioelectrics paper that we publish it tends to have this experiment in there. Uh, the answer is it really is voltage. So you can in in every case that I know of, except for one, you can replace all of the the identity of the ion doesn't matter at all, and the identity of the ion channel doesn't matter as long as you replace them with variants that give the same voltage outcome. So you can do the exact same thing with chloride, with potassium, with uh, 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 with 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 sodium, with protons, and we use uh, ion pumps from yeast in mammalian cells. We use frog channels in uh, in in mammalian cells. It doesn't matter. You can you can swap these out. The 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 genetics of it doesn't matter. What matters is that you get the voltage right. And so that's why these simulators are very important because they tell you. Uh, the properties that you need to, what is it about that channel that's actually important? Maybe it's the voltage sensitivity, maybe it's the fact that it um, has a particular uh, uh, rate of, of, of activity and so on. Uh, as long as you get as long as you get that right, it's what the what the recipient cells are reading is the voltage, not how you got there. It's not it's not the chemistry of how you got there. Okay. And there's actually another one very briefly by Aiden. Doesn't this introduce gross conflict with the Hayflick limit for cellular replication, if not what prevents unlimited replication, for instance, in cancer? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, and we can talk about, um, we can talk about cancer. We have all kinds of data uh, on, on cancer. We've, uh, we've shown that you can both uh, create or induce a, uh, a, metas a full um, a melanoma, metastatic melanoma phenotype with no transgenes, no genetic um, defects, no carcinogens, simply by uh, uh, disrupting the electrical communication between cells, and you can do the opposite. You can take really nasty oncogenes like KRAS mutations, inject it into, into cells, and, and normalize them into being normal tissues by managing the downstream electrophysiology. Um, I, I don't know how this gets around the Hayflick limit. How do the planaria get around the Hayflick limit? Um, un unclear. I'm not sure that we understand the Hayflick limit uh, well enough to answer this. But you know, most of the applications that I'm talking about here don't it, at this point don't don't address the aging problem. So the you know, if a cell is fundamentally damaged to the point where uh, it just can't uh, you know upkeep the various pathways, there's nothing. But bioelectrics isn't going to help with that. But planaria have the secret clearly, and and uh, you know, we we don't know how it works. Okay, so um, so this so so there's a story that uh, that I'd like to show you, which which goes beyond what I've shown you before, and it has to do with this encoding metaphor. So one thing that uh, people often uh, say is that uh, the DNA is the software of the cell, and then the cell itself is the hardware that sort of re reads it out. And at the level of protein structure, that's 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 a fair that's a fair analogy. But I want to give you a different code metaphor at the for for anatomy, because uh. At the level of anatomy, what happens is that the what the genome actually does is it sets your hardware. 
the genome tells every cell what channels and pumps and gap junctions it's going to have. So the genome is what determines the cellular hardware. But the cool thing about these, uh, these, these channels and gap junctions is that they are post-translationally uh, active, meaning they can open and close once they're in place. And that means that when you, when you connect a bunch of these cells to get together into a, into a tissue, you get an excitable medium. Much like in the neural network, you can get propagation of action potentials and computation without um, changes in transcription, meaning just with the standard Hodgkin-Huxley neurons that are there, um, um, channels that are there. You can, and this is this this particular thing here is just a simulation. You can have cells that are uh, identical in transcriptome, identical in proteome, uh, and all of the interesting pattern. So symmetry breaking, spontaneous, all the things you would see in with Turing patterns and so on. All of this stuff can ride on the physics, just like in the nervous system. It does not require uh, transcriptional changes to drive it. Although, of course, downstream there will be um, transcriptional changes. And so this, uh, and so, and so, th this has Im interesting implications that uh, are, are parallel to things we see in, for example, simple flip-flop circuits, which are very simple memory elements that can store an electrical state, but they can be flipped between one state and another that is stable in between. Uh, stimuli. You don't have to keep stimulating them, they simply um, hold state. So you can easily show how memory uh, circuits, much like in the brain, can form in these tissues. And so this makes um, an interesting prediction. It predicts that we should be able to edit this, this software while, while actually keeping the hardware constant by not having to swap out channels and pumps. So I'm going to show you a quick example of this. So here are two planaria. Here is uh, a planarian uh, with one head and one tail. Here's a planarian with one head and one tail. If you ask where the molecular markers are, so the head marker is in the anterior where it should be, there is no head marker in the tail. Uh, same thing over here. And when I cut this one, I get a one-headed worm. When I cut this one, I get a two-headed worm. Now, why would that be? Well, of course, it's because in the meantime, what we did before cutting is we induced, we took this normal bioelectric pattern that says head on this end, no head on that end, and we duplicated it. Now, you can see it's a little messy. The technology is still being worked out, but we can clearly set both ends to be uh, head-like, and then you get this, you get this two-headed form. But here's the really important part to notice. This bioelectric pattern is, is from this animal not from this animal. It is from the one-headed form. In other words, the bioelectric pattern is not a readout or a reflection of what the anatomy is right now. Much like that flip-flop that I showed you where the same hardware can store one of two pieces of information, depending on which way the, the, the current is flowing, this stable electric circuit can, can hold at least two, probably more, but at least two that we know of possible electrical uh, stable states that will sit there and basically do nothing. They're like a latent memory until you injure the animal. And when you injure the animal, that is when this pattern becomes relevant because then the cells will follow and basically build to the information that's here. So at that point, after injury, the cells will then build these uh, a, a two-headed worm. So very important to realize that this bioelectrical pattern does not uh, reflect the current anatomy. It reflects information that will guide towards a future anatomy. So for people interested in basal cognition and the question of where did the nervous system get this amazing trick of being able to represent counterfactual memories, so being able to hold information states that are not the results of the current input that you're getting right now, but of things that happened before or even entertain uh, patterns about things that uh, sh should happen later, this, uh, I think, is uh, is a very simple, evolutionarily, it's a very basal form of this where the tissue can store one of two representations of what a correct planarian looks like, and that representation guides the, um, guides the anatomy. So when we think about this two-headed worm, so I've called it a pattern memory, um, Let's let's just test this idea. So so in, you know what happens when you cut one of these two-headed worms. So we're going to get rid of the normal head. We're going to get rid of the ectopic secondary head that might serve as an organizer. People say, well, it's epigenetically reprogrammed those cells. Fine, we get rid of them. We keep the nice normal uh, middle gut fragment, which has normal genetics, and we cut it in plain water. No more drug, you know, no no more manipulations of any kind. And so the standard paradigm says, well, once you're once you've gotten rid of this, of course you should get a normal worm. And so um, we didn't know this at the time when we first did ex this experiment, but now we actually know that if you plot the uh, the landscape of the circuit that that guides this, there's actually a really nice stable attractor down here uh, at the two-headed state. 
And amazingly, when you cut them, that's in fact exactly what you see. So when you cut these animals, even though they're genetically identical to these animals, they in perpetuity remain two-headed. So all of these fragments continue to make two-headed animals. Now, uh, some years after that, we learned to set it back. So now this is a, a, a true toggle at this point. We can go from one-headed to two-headed. And, each, and, and, and the reason I call this a memory is because it has the major properties of memory. So it's long-term stable. It is labile, meaning you can rewrite it if you know how to manipulate the circuit. It has conditional recall, meaning it often doesn't do anything until you actually injure the animal, and so on. So one, uh, a standard planarian body can hold at least one of two different uh, uh, representations of how to build a correct planarian and when to stop. And so what we're doing now is uh, we are basically trying to build models of these electrical circuits that are um, a merger of two approaches. On the one hand, dynamical systems, where we treat these things as attractors in the state space and so on, and, uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, the kinds of tools that people use in artificial neural networks to identify specific memories with stable states in the attractor space of the network. And so there's a, a, a Santosh Manika is a postdoc in the group wrote a nice review trying to uh, trying to show how these two approaches, the sort of um, artificial neural network approach and the dynamical systems theory approach actually map together quite nicely. And they're sort of two, two faces of the same coin. So um, as I'm running out of time, I just want to show you two very quick uh, two very quick things at the end, uh, what I think is the future of all this. So one of the most important aspects of this is that with the bioelectricity, where, whereas we started you know, 20 years ago, we started in a, in a, uh, at a place where it really wasn't even clear that, that voltage gradients had any role besides housekeeping, we are now to the point where we can make computational models that are that allow uh, predictive and rational changes of outcome. So this is not about making random changes to see what happens. That's what we were doing in around the year 2000 or so. At this point, we can do things like this. So, so if you ask, why is the frog brain misshapen under various teratogens? So here's a normal tadpole brain. Here's a brain where the notch gene has been mutated. Uh, there's, a, there's a dominant mutation that's been introduced into this animal where the forebrain is basically missing. The hind and midbrains are bubbles for, for all intents and purposes. There's no behavior. They don't move. They don't learn. Um, what we could do is build a model of the early uh, neural tube and the electrical pre-pattern that tells the brain how big and what shape it should be. And then we make the model of what happens to the bioelectrics under these various interventions. And we're talking alcohol, nicotine, um, mutations, whatever. And then we can ask this model a simple question. What channels would we have to open and close to get back to the correct pre-pattern? And this is just one example from, uh, from, from work here by Vipoff Pi in my group, also with, uh, with Alexis, um, where what we did was we, we built this model and we asked the model, how would you get back to normal from this disease state? And the model suggested uh, a particular ion channel that can be opened with an existing human approved drug. And when you do that, you take an intervention such as a, muta such as a mutation or, uh, or exposure to really potent teratogens. And for a large number of the, of the animals, you can actually uh, re normalize them such that the brain becomes, you can see here, the, the anatomy of the brain becomes normal, the gene expression becomes normal, and they get their IQs back. Their learning rate is back to that of normal animals. So the idea here is that by building these computational models that link, uh, that, that show you what the dynamics of the circuit, and you need the models because these things are not obvious. You can't just look at these electrical networks and know what to do to get a particular pattern. There, there's too much um, uh, nonlinearity here. So, but but the models are, are are a good way forward, and so what we're hoping to do is to establish a uh, a platform that will take uh, the data on which channels are present, so so uh, profiling data from from the literature, and and the the databases knowledge of what bioelectric state is required. What what do you want? What's the what's the health state compared to the disease state that you have? And then the simulation will basically help you design a cocktail of appropriate openers and blockers that are computationally predicted to shift the complex bioelectric pattern, not a single cell state, but a complex uh, spatial pattern to one that's more correct. And so and this is something we're working on with, with Jack Tuzinski, um, and you can play with it here at the server, I, th I think is, is up right now, where uh, you can actually look up various various tissues, the various channels they express, 
and use this with, with your um, simulator of choice to try to design uh, drug intervention. So this is all meant to be, um, you know, you, what, I've, what I'm trying to show you is, is, is a journey from very basic questions about how uh, tissues might represent uh, uh, anatomical gold states and a very specific mechanistic hypothesis about where that might be, and then quantitative data that uh, that takes that hypothesis and tries to um, basically uh, validate it by by therapeutics. So, uh, what what I've uh, to summarize uh, what I've tried to tell you is that um, there's this really interesting uh, uh, computational layer that sits between the genotype and the anatomy that uh, makes a lot of uh, important decisions that control downstream events. And that this is a really a key target, I think, for, for, for biomedicine. And I think evolution discovered this very early on, that electrical signaling is convenient medium for computation. Uh, I, we, we, we've argued elsewhere uh, that basically a lot of the tricks that you see in the nervous system and in the brain are sped up elaborations of, of things that uh, evolution discovered very early on. So this, this uh, developmental bioelectrics eventually evolved from solving problems in morphous space, anatomical remodeling, to solving very similar problems in three-dimensional space for behavior, meaning control of animal, uh, animal movement. And, and there's lots of interesting things to talk about there. Um, so, so we're now to the point where we have started to, just started to crack this bioelectric code to rewrite these patterns that control the large-scale behavior of cellular collectives. So this is, uh, this is something that in, in other areas that we work on with roboticists and, and engineers, this, is, uh, this goes under collective intelligence. It's basically trying to understand how cell groups, not individual cells, but cell groups, um, can, uh, can, can implement this kind of anatomical homeostasis loop. And we are trying to develop uh, these AI tools that are going to help us gain control of these things. Um, and of course, this will feed back in both directions because I think that once we understand how somatic tissues uh, compute uh, under novel conditions, such as teratogenesis, such as uh, the, the uh, Picasso tadpoles, and so on, we can take some of those lessons back to making better machine learning platforms that are not based on specifically neural architectures, but on far older ways that biology was solving problems. So I want to thank uh, the people. Um, here, here's everybody. I've shown you a lot of work. So here are all the, uh, all the students, uh, postdocs, and, uh, and, and collaborators that have worked with us. I want to uh, thank our, our funders, the Paul G. Allen Frontiers Group, um, and and you know various other foundations that have uh, that have supported us. Uh, again, there's a there's a disclosure, and uh, I just want to uh, I just want to end by uh, showing you a video of these two-headed worms uh, because it's important. You know, the the first time I, I discussed this phenotype um, at a conference, somebody stood up and said that these animals can't exist, and so uh, I just want to show you a video of them so you can see that. Uh, they in fact do exist, and these are the progeny of the two-headed worms that have been cut for many generations in plain water. There's there's, there's no other uh, no other treatment, and uh, the memory is in fact quite um, quite robust. So um, I thank you, and I'll take questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mike, for this fascinating and interesting talk. Uh, you it, you spend so many interesting topics. It's really a buffet of of fascinating stuff, and. Uh, and there are also um, quite a lot of questions already on the chat box. Um, so maybe I combine actually um, uh, two of the questions. So one was about uh, um, the, the, the time scale over which the information is stored, the electrical patterns. So it was a long time scale, I suppose. And then on the other hand, there's a question about, about the microscopic details, whether the gap junctions and, and so on, and the um, channels have very different and important resting potentials. So if these microscopic details are really yeah. important as well on the other scale, and how these different scales are actually combined, it sounds yeah. like a really challenging problem. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question. Yeah, and it and it is a challenging problem. So I can I can tell you a couple of things, although there's way more questions than, than there are answers. So one issue is about the time, the 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 time dimension here. So uh, some of these circuits, like the ones in the planaria, uh, once you make a particular change in the bioelectrics, the circuit has this memory property. It basically holds. So then, and and that hold can be can be as far as we can tell, you know, a really really long time. Um, now, there are other mechanisms, of course, that take over downstream. And so one of the things, for example, that we've seen is that 
uh, in the short term, the, much like in the brain, we have short term memory that's basically electrical, but then the long term memory tends to be other things. Uh, the same thing happens in these other tissues. So there are cytoskeletal rearrangements and other types of uh, non bioelectric changes that uh, that sort of canalize the, sh the short term electrical properties. So there are both long term electrical memory and non electrical aspects like tissue polarity like cytoskeletal structure and so on that um that that are downstream with respect to the spatial scale the important thing about the bioelectric code it is that is it is not a cell level phenomenon so what matters is not the voltage of any one cell what matters is the the difference between a group of cells and the neighboring group of cells and the spatial distribution in which those voltages occur so most of the time changing any one cell so the details at the single cell level usually don't matter if you're going to make a change you need to affect a minimum number of cells and in particular it's no good to um raise the whole the whole tissue up or down in terms of voltage that usually doesn't do anything what you need to do is to do this and establish boundaries so compartment boundaries where the voltage is different across two two neighboring cells that's where all the action is but but again it tends to be large groups i think the minimal if i had to guess what the minimum size is and this is partially our work and partially um adam cohen at harvard the minimum size is something like 50 cells before uh, you know before anything too interesting is going to happen Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Mustafa. Uh, Mike, I mean, that was truly fascinating. Always Thank is you. listening to you. Thank you. Um, now, at the end of your talk, you mentioned you, you're mapping out all the ion channels in all the tissues, and you're going to come up with sort of um, electrocytical cocktails to to treat disease or ion channel dysfunction, something like that. And Mike, how do you see avoiding kind of cross reactivity? Because the ion yeah. channels, the thing about ion channels is there everywhere in the body, every sure, organ, every sure, cell, sure, and so sure. on. Just a general idea. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Um, so, so a couple of things I'll say. So, so first, we are certainly not mapping the channel. So other people are doing that, right? And I'm, we're just taking data, data from others. Okay. So, so the cross reactivity is is really important. There are two two pieces to this. One piece is spatial. So if I want to control the voltage in one particular region, and I'm telling you that I think you're going to be taking a systemic drug that's going to go everywhere, right? How how are you going to have spatial specificity? So right. the way that um, uh, the way that we've we, we've been using it in uh, in our animal models, because remember that in in the examples that I've shown you, especially with the fixing of the brain structure, which is quite spatially specific, right? You need to get exactly the right size of the neural tube. You can't just screw up all the you know voltages everywhere. Uh, those animals were just soaked in the drug. They were just soaked. There was no spatial. And the reason it works is because you can ask the model a very specific question, given where the different channels are expressed and what their properties are in terms of who's going to open and close at different voltages. What is a combination of drugs that's going to be specific for a uh, particular outcome? Now, in some cases, the answer may be there is no such solution, right? So I'm not claiming that this is going to handle everything, and it's certainly not going to handle uh, cases where, heck, you, you know, you're missing some enzyme or something that's just, you know, this right. is not going to fix it. But, um, but, but there's a wide class of, of problems where you can come up with a stimulation that because of the properties of the, you know, for example, what happens in the brain in the in the in the frog brain case is uh, these drugs uh, the the voltages that are in that are already correct they have no effect in those regions because what the drug actually does is increase contrast so cells that are that are um, a, a little bit uh, hyperpolarized it makes it more hyperpolarized cells that are not stay down and in the end you you basically just sharpen the borders what it ends up it's like a contrast enhancer basically for okay. this, for this pattern, um, right? Robert if you'll forgive me I just want to do a little plug and uh, Mike is too modest to mention what the two of us um, edit this wonderful journal called bioelectricity i just wanted to make people aware do submit thanks yeah a little bit of advertisement very good <laughs> very good thanks mr very good. hey um and mike there was a question by giovanni and i think um he's part of the ellen um, discovery center is it right giovanni center? so he yeah. asked to which extent is a bioelectric state inheritable it sounds very interesting if you take one of those worms that develop a head like an um, like another species, and you go to the next generation, do you get the same head? Yeah, this is this is a very good question. Um, so I can say this: uh, we don't have any evidence yet 
that uh, is, that that this is heritable past the traditional uh, sperm and egg mode of reproduction. Okay, so we don't have any evidence for that. Um, actually, getting them to reproduce sexually is is really not easy. We haven't gotten it to work yet, um, and I don't really have any reason to predict that that would happen. However. What's cool about the planaria is that their normal reproductive mode is fission. They normally, at least this species, normally tears itself in half, and now you got two worms, right? That's how they reproduce. So that method of reproduction conserves uh, the new phenotype. So when they do that, it does propagate. So you could imagine throwing these worms in the here over the, over here in the Charles River, and a hundred years from now, some some scientists will come along. They'll scoop up some worms. They'll say, oh, a single-headed form and a double-headed form. That's cool. A speciation event. Uh, and then, of course, you sequence the genome, and guess what? The genome is exactly the same. So uh, I, I don't know if it will go past sperm and egg reproduction. That remains to be seen. So what is a question by Jordan? Do you want to ask yourself, Jordan? Hi there, Michael. Thank you for an amazing talk. Thank um, you so much. Um, so I had I had a few questions, um, the first two of which are related. Um, when you were inducing the frog leg to regrow, you made a single intervention. So um, does this the, electro, um, the electrical uh, pattern um, change over time during limb redevelopment? And so would you expect that making multiple interventions could help regrowth? And then the, my final question was, how precise do you have to be to trigger a leg versus an arm? Yeah, yeah, great, great, great question. Uh, the, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take the second question first. The, the, the precision of it. So, uh, one of the, one of the things that we have that's, that's easier to do, is to, uh, to, to, to catch these trigger signals that basically say build whatever normally goes here. That's the easier version. So the easiest thing to do is to use the exact same intervention that triggers a leg at the end of a stump or a tail on a tadpole, and it's the same intervention. You don't micromanage it. You, so you say whatever normally goes here, go ahead and build it. There are already, this, the system of course did it during embryonic development, so of course they already have all the information that's needed. That's the easiest. The stuff that I showed you where you can actually change the, 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 the shape of what's, what's forming, and I haven't shown you, we have data on size control and, and other things, that's much harder. And so uh, we're, we're working on it, and that's really going to be the future of cracking the bioelectric code is to say, mm, I don't want a regular arm. You know, I want an arm with this many fingers or what it like that. That's, that's where we're going. And we can sort of do that in planaria. We can do some of that in frog. It's, that's basically the future. Right. But for now, what's amazing is that uh, we can trigger these simple uh, kickstart the native uh, the native morphogenetic cascade, and those uh, those those seem to work fine, and those are those seem to be easier to to, to trigger. Brilliant. So it's sort of spatially already pre-programmed in a in a sense. Yeah, I, those are just like used to be here. I can induce. Yeah, th those seem to be easier to access. I mean, look, where this this whole process to me is is reverse engineering, right? We're we're given this amazing thing and we're trying to reverse engineer it. And I think the first thing we found is that it is incredibly modular, and that yes, you can dig into those modules and change how they work. But the easier thing is to just make the subroutine calls and just say, hey, you know, here's here's where you do this. That seems to be how the architecture, the native architecture, works. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are a few more questions on the chat box. Do you want to ask directly, Mark, for instance, or anyone? Yes, sorry, can you hear me? Sure. So I have two questions. The first is, if you apply a beta-cut RNA and depolarization at the, at the same time, what, what privileges? So do you form the head or, or the tail? And my second question regarding the comment you said just uh, you get two phenotypes in 100 years. What happens to the head and the tails? So you just get the, the part in the middle, the head and the tail, do they reform the biheaded or do they get not normal morphology? Because normally fission is just cuts in the middle, not you, not in three parts, right? C c correct, correct. So, um, so there's a couple of subtleties here. Uh, if you uh, the, the, the fission actually is, is not usually exactly in the middle. It can be in a couple of different locations. And what normally happens in the in typical fission is that you get one double-headed animal and one single-headed animal. 
That, that's that's what typically happens. I should point out um, something that I only talked about one phenotype, which are these two-headed animals. There's actually a much more interesting, uh, I think, phenotype that um, we've we've uh, described that that I didn't talk about today, which is something we call cryptic worms. What cryptic worms are are animals that have a permanent. So they're basically, uh, I, I think, the way we think about them is they're sort of. Um, stuck on this bifurcation saddle point where they stochastically choose one head or two heads at each cut. They're destabilized. They don't. They don't really know um, how many heads they're supposed to have. In fact, we just published a paper looking at uh, comparing this to actually bistable perceptions in the visual system. You know, like Necker cube, those kind of illusions where the same network can fall very easily. It's it's sort of balanced between one of two interpretations. So the thing with these uh, cryptic worms is that every piece of a cryptic worm gives rise to cryptic worms. And, uh, and in fact, two pieces that are sitting right next to each other have independent future outcomes. In other words, each piece makes its own independent stochastic decision. And that, and that happens with, with every piece. Um, the, uh, what was the first question? Oh, the, the beta, the beta cat. So, hmm. right. So, so, so here's the thing. Uh, the, when, when you do this, so, so, so the, the beta cat and the various genes that are, the, that, uh, that are important for building heads and tails, are downstream of the bioelectric machinery. So if you perturb the implementation machinery such that uh, the, the, no amount of bioelectrics is gonna be able to make a head if you don't have the genes that are necessary to, to, to make a head. So when you, when you block things downstream, you're going to prevent it. What's interesting, and we've done, you can um, sort of email me afterwards and we can, I can take you through a lot of the data. Um, when you, when you uh, start to wrestle with, start to compare those two pathways directly, one of the interesting things that you see is that when you, for example, induce ectopic heads with beta cat, they're often uh, they're often not scaled correctly. In other words, mm -hmm. you got the tissue identity right, but 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 you didn't get the size control. They're sort of and, and we have we have pictures of this in, in the last paper. They're they they're kind of a funny scale. When you do the bioelectrics, you catch all the downstream stuff because it is a it is a higher level signal. So they're properly scaled. They're you know they get the correct head size and 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 all of that. So there are some there are some interesting kind of cross um, comparisons to be made. I think I think it's a great question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maybe one last question, Salvador had a question. Do you want to just uh, ask it yourself? Okay, maybe. Uh, I, I, I lost my uh, unmute button. I, I haven't really used Teams before. Um, yes, my, my question was, is it possible to um, bioelectrically reset I, either individual cells or, or small fractions of the planaria? There, there was a question earlier about the heritability of these bioelectric states, and it seems that, um, or at least it, it seems plausible to me that if, if it's difficult to get the planaria to reproduce, that maybe an alternative way of assessing that would be to um, perturb the bioelectric state somehow, then reset some small fraction and, and, and see if um, that uh, small fraction can still grow into the organism with the two heads or a, a head from a different species or something. Yeah, so you can certainly, um, we can certainly reset them back to normal. So we can take a two-headed worm and, and cut pieces and reset those pieces back to a normal pattern. And then you're back to a normal wild type worm that will continue to make normal worms. So you can certainly reset it. So so that kind of, uh, that, that, the, that aspect of the memory holds uh, for very long periods of time and, and it's certainly um, stable across fission and across cutting and those kinds of things. I just don't know what happens when you have that that bottleneck where everything comes down to one cell, the egg, and then and then develops again. I can, I can sort of imagine how it might work, but we don't have any evidence that that's what happens. Sure, thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, maybe in the interest of time, I think um, maybe it's a good time to stop here. Um, I wanted to say thank you again to Mike for taking so much time and explaining and giving such a fantastic, inspiring talk and to everyone for attending. And uh, it's a fantastic community I think we're having here. So thank you again and um, see you all soon. Thank you all so much.